go ahead and start because our time is so limited. It's wonderful to see those of you who were here last week come back, and we have some new people too. Um, we're so fortunate to have Jonathan Golden with us, who is a professor through uh, in the theology department and the convener of So often out there in the world, people tend to think of religion as the source of, of conflict, right? That is driving conflict. Um, and how can it actually contribute instead to conflict resolution? Um, I'm just going to very briefly return to um, some things I talked about last week, particularly in the Presbyterian tradition, right? Of uh, Lectio Divina, uh, divine reading, and this practice of um, praying the Bible that involves reading, reflecting, responding, and resting in the Word of God. Um, so it involves listening or reading, um, meditation, reflecting on the Word of God, uh, oratio, responding, and um, con contemplatio, resting in the Word. And uh, it's really interesting because it's straight, you know, as I was kind of reviewing this, it strikes me that these are very, very important principles for how we communicate with each other. Right? Not just simply how we are looking at like text, scripture, and responding to it. Um, do we practice all four of these steps when we're communicating with, with our friends, our family, and you know, very important, particularly when we're communicating with adversaries or people that we perceive to be adversarial, right? Um, particularly the listening part, right? I think this is something that we all, it, it's at the heart of it. So, um, Two just thoughts I wanted to share. Um, first of all, we so I want to kind of focus today in particular on these two: the meditation, the reflecting, and the oratio, the responding. And this is very much part of that something that we call active listening, right? And some of you may be very familiar with it; others may have heard of it. Um, it's not quite rocket science. I have a, a colleague, Ibu Patel, who. Who says it's not rocket science? It's harder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we can go that far, but the truth is, successfully practicing the active listening, um, you know, really can be quite difficult. Um, and, and you notice that they also come in this order, right? In other words, that we're we're listening and we're reflecting on what someone has said to us before we respond, right? And I think that's one of the issues that we have. I mean, and we have sort of terrible modeling out there in our world, right? I mean, um, 
you know, you, uh, you, you look at CNN and they brought in two different perspectives and I mean, the people are talking over one another as the moderator sits there and like you can't, you know, listen to anyone, <coughs> right? There's no real engagement. Um, people are just shouting out there. Um, what we'll call today, you know, their points of view, whatever it be, but we'll call positions because we're going to get back to that in a moment. What's the difference between positions, interests, and needs? So kind of stick a pin in that thought as well. Um, before going deeper into it, I just want to share that there are two other traditions that are very similar in some ways. Um, one is actually within the Jewish tradition, it's called the Havuta. The idea that you sit, um, it actually comes from the root, many of you might, might know the word taber. Um, if you remember when Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, you would see Shalom Kaber, the by friends, go hunted and things, he said that. And anyway, so you might be familiar with the term taber, which means friend. And then in the Hebrew language, they then sort of build all kinds of different words off of that root. Um, so a chavruta is where um, friends, or people that potentially could be friends, come together and study a text with one another. And um, you are supposed to disagree. You are supposed to kind of tear it apart. You're supposed to dig you know, deep into it and, and what does it mean to you. And then there's a wonderful, um, in the inter interfaith um, field, um, called scriptural reason. You can see that term right here. Oh, this thing's not gonna shine on that. Um, but scriptural reason is a fresh approach to modern day interfaith dialogue which puts scripture at the heart of the conversation. And this is just another place where um, we view religion as a, as a means, right, for resolving conflict. And this idea that you bring people from different faiths together, sitting and reading each other's texts. You might have a group of three, five people sitting around a table, they'll read a Christian text, they'll read a Jewish text, they'll read a, a Muslim text. Um, and what does it mean, right? Um, and how do we um, how do we dig in, how do we find shared values? And not only that, I mean, one of the big kind of mistakes and misconceptions is that <clears throat> of doing interfaith work is that you're supposed to always find the point of agreement. And I would argue very much not so, um, that one of the great sort of um, uh, meanings and, and in truth joy of doing interfaith dialogue is to actually look at those points of difference and say, well, how different are we, where do those differences stem from, and not to necessarily see those as things that drive us apart. So that was the, my question already in the parking lot coming in this morning. Um, how do we deal with, you know, with, with people in conflicts across vastly different value systems? Um, and I think there's a lot there. We, we begin by asking ourselves, how different are they? Um, and not always trying to force us to find a common ground. Because one of the things that frequently happens, we know from, you know, I'm doing, I come home some days, my, my third grader comes home with her math homework, and I'm like embarrassed that <laughs> I help her with it, right? But we know in math, the idea is um, we're reducing things, right, to the lowest common denominator, right, when you're doing fractions. Um, that doesn't really work, though, in the real world when we're trying to engage with difference, because you often dumb it down so, you know, so low, that, okay, so we can agree that, you know, we all have a heartbeat or a pulse. Um, that's not particularly helpful. So we need to get out of this way of thinking that we always need to find common ground, that we need to always, you know, find a point of agreement and, and, and leave it there. The other misconception, um, one of the people whose work um, we engage with quite a bit in my conflict resolution program, and I'll refer back once or twice, Daniel Shapiro, who is the founder of the program on negotiation at, at Harvard. Um, and, um, you know, he kind of says, we, we, we have this saying in, in our world, um, let's agree to disagree and leave it there. And, and his point is, that was your moment right there. It was like when Aaron Judge was looking at that <coughs> fastball, right, and sat there and didn't swing at it. Um, that's your moment, that is your opportunity to dig in and say, okay, here, we've identified something that we can now sort of grapple with. Let's not stop here. Agree to disagree, 
you get to a disagreement, and I think I, I, I mentioned this term last week from another colleague of staying in the crucible, right? The kind of fortitude and courage to stay there when things get a little bit heated. Wonderful if we can dial the heat down and still live with the difference and still engage in a difficult conversation. But we can't just let things, you know, escalate, they're, they're hot, they're too fraught, and then that's when we say, well, we agree to disagree and walk away. Because then it will always remain a disagreement that is divisive. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that because when I first was reading about uh, the tradition of Lectio Divina, the first thing I thought of was scriptural reasoning where we, we do the precisely the same thing, but we work with people from different faiths and texts from different faiths. And it can be a great opportunity. And part of the idea as well is that um, it works precisely because when you're, if you're engaging with, with you know, other people of faith, um, like the text is so close to your heart. It's almost like the hearth within your home. And so this is a particularly potent place for reading and engaging with, with difference, right? Um, it's something that, that matters and has meaning to all of us. Um, I actually, I, I wanted to go back, this was the original statement that went out in the email to all of you inviting me to this um, last Saturday night, I believe, um, and I just wanted to return to this question. It's hard not to ponder the long-running historical dance between religious belief and conflict, violence and nonviolence. <clears throat> How can we account for this? What, if anything, can we do once and for all to uncouple the two? And how can we as people of faith contribute to a world in which religion actually lessens conflict? And I thought that this was stated so well um, and really captures you know, the essence of one of the most important things we need to talk about. So I'm gonna share quickly a story. Um, um, this is going back, I don't know, 20 years already. I, um, when I was getting into the field of conflict resolution, and I you know, couldn't get enough, right? I was sort of taking little certificate trainings and things like this here and there. And one of the several um, certifications that I did was, um, it was called Rodev Shalom, which means pursuer of peace. And it was built on the tradition of conflict resolution within the, the Old Testament and then the Talmud, right? Which is the study of that. Um, and it, it was a class that took place, the idea being that Aaron, in the, in the Bible, he's actually known as, he's called that several times, Rodef Shalom. It literally means hunter for peace, which is a very interesting idea. Um, partly that we, we run into the fire, right? We don't stand and say, well, wait till the flames die down and then maybe see what I can salvage, but that we, you know, we see a conflict brewing, we, we get in there, you know, as quickly as, uh, as possible. Um, and so reading all kinds of texts, that, um, that pose these types of problems. When do we engage with conflict? How do we engage with conflict? How can we benefit <coughs> from engaging with conflict? And so this course took place um, concurrently. It was run by the Pardes Institute, uh, and it took place concurrently in like six different cities in the United States. So I drive into New York City, and I was taking the class there. Other people were in LA, other people were in DC, and so forth. And then at the very, very end, we came together um, for, you know, not everybody from around the country attended. They did it like in, it was near Baltimore at a retreat center there um, that they brought people together for an in-person, well, it was always in-person, this was long before COVID, but to bring together the, the larger, you know, group. Um, and it was like a weekend long program. And, um, it was really fascinating because you can imagine this is a self-selected group. Everybody is there because we want to peace. How can we learn from our own tradition to help bring peace in this world and resolve conflicts in our communities, but resolve you know bigger global conflicts as well. As well. At least contribute to um, resolution and transformation of those conflicts. And so most of us were all very similar in our point of view. We're looking at and saying, look, it says it right here, you know, here's what you gotta do, and here's what you gotta do. And interestingly, this is where the story gets really weird, there was a young man there um, who was actually quite quiet most of the time and was um, 
And then at a certain point, like as our first afternoon was going on, seemed to be getting like a little bit agitated. Um, and, and that kind of seemed to increase. It was a group about this, this big, so if someone's kind of, you know, you might notice. And so I certainly noticed. And, um, and so we're looking at this text and saying, well, look at Aaron here, look at how he engaged, and look at how he resolved that conflict, and look here at the Talmud, this piece that says, you know, if two of your friends are fighting, don't let it fester, you jump right in there and try and help out as early as possible, and so forth. And, and by the way, that's a wonderful tradition also reading Matthew and, 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 and Jesus' message also, to get in there as quickly as possible, right, when there's a conflict brewing. Um, but this guy is like almost, you know, waving his hands around. And suddenly he stands up and says, well, you guys are all sitting here reading all these texts this way. But how do we know that that's the way we're supposed to be reading it? And how do we know that these are the ones that we're supposed to be focusing on? Remember the story of Pinchas, of Phineas, who sees, you know, Aaron's sons enter into the holy space, takes out a sword and kills them on the spot without even a question, without a word of exchange, takes out his sword and murders them, and this absolves of any guilt. And he says, how do we know that that isn't the message? It's in the Bible, just like anything else. And that put a, suddenly the room, <laughs> you can imagine the dynamic change dramatically. What was the side story that's really funny is then over here, two of them start, who is the guy? How did he, what is he? <laughs> <laughs> who is he? We were like, um, you know, shared rooms, right? And so you could imagine where this is going, can you? And like, well, who is he in the room with? Oh, Jonathan, it's okay, he'll be able to handle this guy. <laughs> so there I was at 3 a.m. talking with this guy um, that very night. Um, but it, but it, like, it was a moment for all of us because it raised this really important question, right? Um, one of the things that happens in, in religion and our relationship to conflict is there are things in all of our traditions that, that seem to be contradictory, that sometimes send mixed messages. Um, it's not all always peaceful all the time. Um, and how do we do? I mean, he raised a very legitimate question, right? He really did. Um, it would be easier if he weren't there and he could just focus on these other texts the whole time. But, but there he was raising this really, really important question. And, um, you know, I share that story in my teaching a lot because it really, for me, was a, a, a moment of great realization. Um, because, you know, to your question, Pat, it's not only someone from a vastly different value system. Here, oh, here's the really funny footnote to the story, by the way, is that by the time they're like, who was this guy? How did he register? Because then they saw he hadn't been in any of the other classes. He just showed up at the retreat. And apparently, this is great. His mom somehow saw it and thought it was a Jewish singles event. <laughs> oh my god! Oh no! Oh my god! And so, my son, you know, is in his 20s, gonna meet a nice Jewish girl. <laughs> and this guy was like, what the hell did my mom say? <laughs> you know, there was real. It was, so this is a moment of kind of comic relief in this story. Um, but it really was enlightening and eye opening for me because um, it's not just with people of different value systems, uh, uh, ostensibly. And as we know, this is one of the other kind of really fascinating things that I've learned um, in this work is that our, our most fraught, uh, heated, emotive conflicts are fre frequently with our own. It's not so hard to look at someone from a different faith tree. Oh, you know, they're, they're Hindu, they're Buddhist. That's really fascinating to me, but my God, that's on the other side of the world, vastly different culture. The system, you know, doesn't even, it's hard to even find corollaries, and it's okay that you're different because it's no, it's so different that it doesn't in any way, like, um, threaten me, right? Whereas then you get to, to Abrahamic traditions, where, and I don't use that term a lot because I know it's meant to be an inclusive interfaith, but of course you just excluded half of the people in the world, right? When you just focused on, but imagine that you move into that circle, um, and now we are talking about some of the same figures and some of the very same texts, right? In many cases, or at least stories, um, between Islam and Judaism and Christianity, and it gets a little bit more heated. 
And then we really realize if we look at it, that some of the most difficult conflicts that we have on a daily basis are actually within our own community. And to give you really like, um, um, you know, outlandish examples of this, I mentioned last week, you know, with, uh, getting back to that initial question of how can religion be a source of conflict resolution, and I mentioned that the most famous, right, peacemakers of all time um, come from faith traditions, right? Um, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and if you think about it though, many of the sort of great peacemakers that we've seen over the last two centuries have acts that have been killed, they have given their lives for building peace, have been killed not by the other, but by their own. Gandhi was killed by another Hindu. Yitzhak Rabin, who made peace with, with um, uh, you know, Palestinians or tried to, was killed by another Jew. Anwar Sadat, who made peace with Israel, was killed by a fundamentalist Muslim, right? Um, you know, you go back and Michael Collins was killed by other Irish Republicans, right? It is frequently our own, um, inside our own circles, where these conflicts get most fraught. Yeah. Well, you just raised one in the two weeks you've been with me, with us, sorry. <laughs> 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 It's actually one of the few examples of a successful peace process in, in Northern Ireland. And we, I just took students this past summer. We were in Cori Mila, um, which is a famous um, religious peace building center in the very, very north of Ireland. And you could actually see Scotland you know, from there. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I recommend it. They host retreats all the time. And it might be an interesting thing to think about. Um, but that's exactly right. I mean, so here's what happened in that conflict in many ways. Um, many of the, so I, I've been doing research for a number of years now on um, folks who were directly impacted by conflict, either victim survivors, they had a, a child that was killed in a suicide bombing or, or something like this, um, or actually the perpetrators. I've interviewed a number of, of well, they were young men when they had been in prison, um, right, and one of the interesting things is that that is frequently where they make friends. Um, a story, you know, from the book that I'm working on on this research, where you know you had a um, a loyalist, meaning the, the people that were kind of saw themselves as British, aligned with the British, and loyal to the crown, um, and wanted a separate Northern Ireland that was still going to be British-looking, part of the United Kingdom. Um, and then those that wanted a united uh, island of Ireland that would be all Republican, right? The nationalists. Um, and fascinating story of the, then they all end up in prison together. One of the things that happens in prison is they realize how alike they are with each other, more so in many cases than the people that were driving them to fight. It was often sort of elites or people that were not even in their sort of social class, right? Who were arming them who were funding them, who were pushing them to go fight the good fight. But meanwhile, there they would land in prison together. So this story of this guy, Martin, who I interviewed, he had, um, he as a young man saw the Republicans attacking his community, that was his perception of it, the IRA. So he takes up arms with a, a loyalist, you know, the Ulster militia. Um, he goes into a bar in, in Belfast with a bomb. It goes off prematurely and he kills an IRA member's mom 
and injures a couple of other people that were in the bar. And anyway, he ends up in prison. Um, he tells the story of being in prison where there was, he was then taking advantage of um, like an in-prison education system that they had. You could do like a kind of distance learning degree inside the prison. And so he's studying, there's another guy that's studying, the other guy is a member of the IRA. And so for the first weeks, they're like in the same space and literally in the same room together every single day, but pretending that they don't see each other. And then they're to the point where they're like doing almost a ballet dance to avoid one another. So they're both reaching the teapot at the same time, you know, and then like, oh, over here. And, and so finally one day, they just, they both realize how, after weeks, how ridiculous what they're doing really is. And so they start to talk just a little bit. And one notices that, that you know, the other guy has a picture, they have like a little cubby. Um, they both have pictures of their family. So they start talking about their families, they start talking about their work, they start talking about their lives. They realize that they're both sort of blue collar, working class, very, very similar. Um, and at the end of the day, that the differences between them, as you suggest, were very, very little. And this becomes the sort of groundwork for building peace. Many of those relationships actually um, um, were built inside the prisons, right? And then similarly on the outside as well, you started to have as the peace process was taking hold. Um, and then it took a few really brave individuals to say, look, if we can do this, you can do this as well. Right? If we can, we were, you know, I'm a commander in the IRA, I'm a commander in the UVA, an Ulster Force, and look, we are communicating and talking with one another, and that was their message to the rest of their communities as well. So, um, this idea that, you know, we, we frequently, it's, it's like, how do we perceive of the us and them, and how we define our communities, that is a process, right? That is not as organic as we think. Um, and there, are, and, and, and how do we? How can we change our minds once we actually start listening to one another? Um, so back to the point about the um, the story of Phineas, right? The, I, I may as well just start calling him Pincus when I tell this story. The guy who stands up and says, "How do we know it's not this?" So you know, I, I think of an example from Christianity as well, right? And there are many, many examples <coughs> in, in Judaism where all these messages. And then you turn around and there's this horrible message of, of violence. Um, so look, you know, there's no shortage, as we know, of amazing, beautiful quotes, um, you know, in the Bible, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I mean, that's perhaps the most powerful one right there. But we can go through each of these where they are really foregrounding peace. This is the ultimate goal, and in many ways Jesus is sort of saying, this is my message. Right? That we serve God, that we love one another, when we make peace with one another, um, and so forth, right? Um, we then have to deal with this. Do not think that I have come to bring peace, um, I'm sorry, to the earth. That's a terrible... <laughs> um, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Now, I know that, you know, Generations of Christians have grappled with this and say, well, what, what does Jesus really mean? He doesn't literally mean it. So we could, you know, go around in circles about ways of interpreting this. But I can assure you, I can promise you, because in my work I've also studied, like, white supremacist, hateful, racist, neo-Nazi movements in America, and this is their favorite quote. Right? So we, even if we can sit here this Sunday morning and grapple with this particular line and say, well, it doesn't mean violence, this isn't really what, you know, we have to confront the fact that there are hateful, violent people out there, right? Timothy McVeigh, who blew up the Oklahoma City, you know, the building, the federal building, um, his movement, his group, this is like their motto. I can root it in my Christian tradition. And this is the time where that we're at now. Yeah, all that other stuff, but we're here now. In the 21st century, Jesus is back and he's got his sword this time. And here's my sword this time. It's an AK-47. <clears throat> it's a bomb, whatever it may be. Right? And again, I want to be really clear. We can obviously find these types of things in every tradition. Um, but So what do we do with this? 
I only actually and let me ask that as a real question. What would you all do with this? What would you say to a fellow Christian that might walk in here now and say, this, this is the single most important line in all of all the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. By the end, Jesus made the Sermon on the Mount, all these other things that happened, but in the end, this is what we walk away with. What do we what, what do we do with that? What do we do with some of these? That's the most important line I said, well in that case, let's not just take it at face value and let's sit with it. Yeah, I mean, that's great, right? You can't just take it and, and run with it as, you know, we're, we're in an age where I'm particularly vulnerable to this with social media, where, you know, what do you get? Maybe 280 characters now if you're on Twitter, less if you're on other platforms and so forth. And people are just slogan, slogan, repeating slogans. They don't even know, you know, what they mean. Yeah. Well, you can see that as a metaphor for what you were talking about. So, uh, sword is not necessarily violent so much as confronting the issue before. Yeah, right, okay, and, and you know, and there's other interpretations that have been offered. He's separating, you know, using a sword to separate believers from non-believers, right? Um, and so, so there's lots of ways that we can sort of grapple with this, but, but this is the point, is that we have to. We can't, the one mistake that we frequently make is just to cherry pick the things and selective readings. This is, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, and I'm going with that, right? You know? <laughs> And when this other stuff is sort of in there, that we need to kind of grapple with the deeper meaning of it, sit in the crucible, right? Because you can be sure that guy is that, you know, the Timothy McVeigh or whomever is going to cite this is not going to say, okay, you win. They're going to come back, you know, with more, yeah. I was going to say, too, what's the context? What came before and what comes after? Mm -hmm. I think that's a problem today, too. You know, yup. The, the shock, you know, culture that we live in, right? They said this, they said that, um, out of context, short video clips. I mean, even worse, right? Because now we're in the age of, of AI where, you know, you think you're seeing something and it was <coughs> fabricated, right? And so there's, we're, we're, all of these problems are now compounded and, and even more profound for us to confront in the age that we're living. Now, at least back in the day, we didn't have to deal with, you know, deep fake videos and and somebody really say this and whatnot, right? So, um, so we must grapple with it, right? I mean, I think that's something that we all agree on. We can't just say, well, I'm gonna go with this, not this. Looking at context, right? Tra at traveling into the place where this came from and, and sort of trying to move horizontally. What else was happening at the time? What was that person responding to, um, right? I mean, I know I, I, I'm guilty of this. I will sometimes, um, you know, I'm giving a talk, uh, or I'm talking to my class, and I know one student is thinking that I will embed all kinds of messages to that particular person, right, in my talk, bundle it in there, you know, and it'll seep in more deeply, and 16 other people are like, what is he talking about, right? And so, like, how do we communicate um, um, transparently, right, and in a really, really, like, honest and genuine way, and I think this is a real important so we can sort of come back to this. Um, so when we think about conflict, and I kind of left you last week um, asking, um, what are some of the types of conflicts, and, and maybe we should you know, begin to shift right now, like what are some of the things um, that you all <clears throat> find to be most sort of vexing or perhaps most threatening right, <laughs> in our society today? Of course, internal conflict, and one of the things we talked a little bit about last week, and it's, and it's always there. It's fascinating that in, in virtually every tradition, I mean, also in Matthew, is when Jesus is talking about, you know, you're trying to pull something out of your friend's eye, a splinter, you realize the log that's in your own eye. Um, you know, this is a, a critical piece in the Buddhist tradition, right? Like, resolve yourself before you can resolve others. Right? Until you've dealt with some of your own internal struggles, um, you're not yet in a position to go and, and solve and contribute to solving the uh, you know, external um, conflicts. And then, as I've mentioned, some of our most fraught conflicts are in our own family, 
right? If you ask anybody, and of course, these are the ones that are most painful as well. You know, I can't stand what's happening in the Middle East. Well, for most of us, we have the luxury we can turn the TV or the radio or the internet off and just ignore it, pretend it's not happening. When it's inside your own home and inside your own family, or it's your children, or it's your brother or sister, um, you you know you can turn away, right? But that's a much harder thing to do. Um, in our congregations, right? Again, we're all here. We woke up early on a Sunday morning because this has great value and meaning to us. This is where our, our hearts are. Um, and in the communities that we live in, um, and of course right now, right, we're, we're barely a week away from the election, um, and there are things that matter to us deeply about what our country is going to look like, at least for the next four years, if not longer, um, right? And these things are meaningful to us, and of course, conflicts that are happening in the in the world. So, hey, I'll just pause there for a moment and ask, I mean, were there particular things that you guys thought about? Um, what do we see as some of that? And do we see some of these as more, like, important or pressing than others? Do we need to fix our internal conflicts before we go and, you know, get out there in the community and, and, and engage with challenges that we see? Um, this is a sort of open question. One of my questions is, what do you do when you really, at least you think you are sincerely wanting mm -hmm. to solve a conflict, and the other party wants nothing to do with it, and that absolutely shuts you out? Yeah, that's really, really hard. So, so, and I love the way that you phrased the question, Martin, because this, is, this comes back to that part about dealing with ourselves first. I think more often, you know, we think we're being an honest broker more than we actually are, right? We tell ourselves that we're the, you know, we're on the right side of this issue, we're the ones that are holding the moral ground, we, and that is, that contributes to the problem, this idea that we're pretty sure that we're seeing the problem the right way, and it's the other person. And there are instances where it, it is the other person, right? But I think that we need to really confront ourselves first. So one of the um, one of the methods that we use is um, so there is the blame game, right? Where you're assigning or ascribing blame to the other party or to other parties, um, and then there's the contribution model. What are we all contributing to this problem? Right? And that's a really deeply reflective part of this. You go and look in the mirror and say, what did I do? What, have I ever done anything that has pushed this person to the position that they're in? Um, is there anything that I'm not doing that I could be doing to be more inviting, to be more ingratiating, right? Um, and some, some mediators literally use this method where they, they like will do a 10%. They'll send the parties home and say, what, you know, is there ten percent of this problem that you are responsible for? Right? You can say ninety percent. That's a pretty good percentage, right? Ninety percent is on the other part. But find that ten percent that you're doing. The other person, the same thing. You come back the next week. You're twenty percent, almost a quarter of the way to resolving the conflict, right? And so this is really important. But then the next step, of course, is have we really listened to that person? Right? And one of the problems is that, you know, as I alluded to earlier, when we're in this mode where it just becomes a shouting match, where my slogan is more powerful than your slogan, my words are going to be sharper and more piercing than your words, we want to win every argument rather than learn from the disagreement, um, we get stuck in, you see that the distance gets further and further apart. So it's really funny to see me doing it now. I try the contribution model with my nine-year-old and my four-year-old as they're, you know, <laughs> screaming and kicking in the back seat, and and we literally do it. My wife and I are like, what, you know, what did you contribute to this? Is there anything you could have done differently? And first of all, it's it puts a pause on the conflict because if they can just breathe for a half a second and start to think about it, and they may still come back and say, I can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> but at the very least, you dial the emotion and the heat down just a little bit, 
Um, and then, of course, that gets you to, if you think about it, it's not just what did I contribute to the problem, but that very easily translates into what can I contribute to the, to the solution, right? So the contribution model, rather than the blame game, because we can sit here all day very easily find all the blame to dump on, make a long list of everything that the other party has done wrong, but that list of what we could do a little bit better um, could be a lot more. And, and actually this speaks to something else I wanted to share. Um, so let me, um, <coughs> um, okay, so hold on, I've got somewhere, I thought I did um, um, two images, one image, and it's called the iceberg. Um, Yeah, here we go. So if you look at this, um, this is what we call the iceberg model. And you know, we, we you know, iceberg model is an idea that is used in, in various different like iterations in different fields. It's the simple idea that most of what is really happening is happening beneath the surface, right? And so in this case, this is something that we use in conflict resolution, and it comes also with this sort of you know, pin like positions, interests, needs, model. And what do you notice about this? And, and there's very good reason why we're putting two triangles or two icebergs together here. Um, what do you notice about the sort of geometry of this? Um, so let's just very quickly. So positions are just what you present publicly. And, and as many of you said already today, like the simplest thing that we put forward on the surface, right? That's our sort of position. Um, if it's like a, a labor dispute, um, it's we want a raise, we want, you know, ten dollars more per hour, right? That's a position. Well, we can only give you two dollars more. And those are two positions. You get deeper to interests, right? Like, what's, what's more behind that? Is there other things? Are there working conditions? Are there, you know, that sort of stuff? And then needs, like, what would you actually do with the additional money if you got it? Right? Because at the end of the day, it's not quite, you don't just want to see your bank account like go up. You maybe you need child care <coughs> desperately, right? Like teachers union and they're fighting over this and they say we need to get paid more. A good mediator might really get them to what are you gonna do with the additional money? And if a vast majority of them say, Well, here's a real problem, and this is I can tell you this, like I don't get out of school till you know till 3.30, you want me there till 3.30, my kid's getting out at three. I then have to pay for like a couple of hours of childcare, right, just to, and then that costs me money. At least, if it, so maybe the school says there's other ways around that. Maybe we can provide childcare, right? So this is a really simple example of, but you need to kind of unpack what the needs are to really, because at the, at the level of positions is, is where it's most difficult. So what do you notice about the geometry? Where are the two parties furthest apart? On the surface. On the surface, right? At the slogan level, right? And no matter what, you know, choose what your slogan is. Make America great again, from the river to the sea. These slogans that are floating out there in our ecosphere right now that are so divisive that we respond to, how dare you say that? That's offensive, that is, right? Alienating, um, when we're still stuck, when we're shouting slogans at, an, uh, at each other from across the green, um, there's no engagement whatsoever, and we push each other further apart. Whereas once we start to kind of get into conversation with people and talking with people and saying, what is your deeper emotional human need, we find that we do share quite a bit. So in some ways, this does get to that, how do we deal with people from vastly different value systems, because we have to then ask ourselves like, okay, their traditions are different, they dress differently, they talk differently, but at the end of the day, you'll probably find most people are actually concerned about the roof over their head, and then they put food on the table for their kids, right? And so from there, you can go up your you know, hierarchy of, of needs, but there's these sort of deep core human needs that we do all share. And in many ways, that is a, a way across some of these different you know, value systems, um, right? Because the, the, uh, it's like many of the things that we tag as value system 
I think inadvertently, you know, we always are actually closer to those positions at the highest sort of surface level, whereas if when we get to a deeper level, um, we find that many of our faiths, right, around the world, or even within the different denominations, right, at the end of the day, we have much the same thing in mind. And then just some other examples of it. I mean, here's one if you sort of fill this out. Um, but ultimately, needs are, you know, the fundamental, as you can see it on my screen, things and feelings for which all people strive. Um, the negative emotions are almost always caused by unsatisfied need, and needs are the root of all the desires we have and actions that we take. Um, and so sometimes that, you know, like that gets us into areas of greed, but well, this person is taking more than they need, um, but it's really helpful to have that conversation because we can talk about that when you can engage in a conversation where you realize, you know, the way that you're construing uh, and communicating your needs actually gets in the way of everybody else getting what they need. Um, sometimes the greedy person doesn't quite realize that, right? Um, is unaware of that. It takes literally surfacing that stuff for the people to understand. And then this is just you know, an example, um, like similar to what I talked about before. The position of the union, the position of the, the school or the college that's paying them, right? But ultimately there are ways to understand. We're all here because our mission is to educate people, right? We're all here for this, this is our mission. The mission statements are frequently quite similar. Um, so maybe I'll just go back for a moment. Um, so this was, again, I think I mentioned this last week, but I thought I would kind of put it on the screen for you all to see. Um, I become increasingly, this actually comes from the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, um, uh, uh, like a conference that they convene. I have become increasingly aware that in times such as this, we cannot simply be people of great resources and information. We must also be a people of great transformation. Um, so maybe this is a good moment to also talk about um, what we mean by conflict transformation. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, I really liked your expert response. I think it was very interesting. I was thinking, in those conflicts that you're trying to resolve, I think there are people out there that are all above the surface, and they don't even know what the other two interests and needs. They didn't even thought that far. They're just caught up yeah. in what's above the surface. And those are the hard people to reach because they haven't thought it through yet. Right? It's true. I mean, you know, the, the horrible example that jumps to mind is, you know, the story that we just, and I think it happened a while ago when she was just maybe indicted, but the, the woman in Montclair who tore down the Greek flags thinking they were Israeli flags, right? And it's like, know what the, like, if you don't know what the, the difference between the Greek flag and the Israeli, the colors are very similar, I got you on that. But if you don't know the difference between those flags, you really, maybe you shouldn't be out there, like, tearing flags down if you don't know yet what the flag is. It's, a, it's you know. The other example, I mean, that just can't help but come to mind is the mosque. You raise your own baby to hate Jews. And, you know, it's just inculcated into you. Yeah, I mean, some are, right? I mean, but frequently it's that's not the case. I mean, I think that's part of it. That's what we think. So in other words, how many of us have really sat inside a mosque and, and heard their message and so forth, right? So part of it is the narrative that kind of gets out there, and then that becomes our reality. So this, in some ways, is the most important reason why we need to engage with people with whom we disagree, because we actually then dwell in the world of like caricatures of what we think the other person you know really thinks i mean another really horrible example is the young man dylan roof right he was the um the be became a white supremacist young man in uh was it north carolina who walked into a, a church right and murdered nine people he i mean the guy sat through the hour-long bible study and still did that but what happened was the FBI, after the fact, um, did like a forensic study of his internet searches. And they found that it started, it was after Trayvon Martin, right, the young man that was shot essentially for wearing a, a hoodie and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
Um, and Dylan Roof decided, it was, he kept hearing the term like uh, black on white crime. So he Googled that. And if you think about it, imagine putting that into a Google search, what you're gonna hit. That became the gateway to a world of hate. And within an hour, he was deep into neo-Nazi websites. And within weeks, a boy who had been raised in a relatively tolerant environment, his, it wasn't like a, you know, sometimes we say, well, this poor kid never had a chance. You know, you see images of kids in like KKK, you know, uh, hoods and stuff from, from birth, right? This wasn't the case with him. He was raised in a tolerant, like sort of moderate household. One little internet search is what got him all the way there. So instead of, instead of like meeting black people, right, and engaging and well, what's going on and, and having some conversations across communities, he created a cartoon monster for himself by reading about people what the internet had to say about them. So this is part of it as well. Um, you know, we've got a, a brand new mosque that's mm -hmm. being built right here in Madison, uh, you know, uh, on land that used to be owned by Drew. Um, I've already invited the guy to come to campus when they first announced that they were gonna do this to meet the community. When they launch, we're gonna invite them again. Uh, inshallah, the Islamic world for God willing. Um, uh, they'll invite us in and they'll open it to Jews and Christians and Hindus to come into the Mahid and they will say, look, this is who we, we are, um, right? Because the funny thing is that if you're just, you know, it's a perfect metaphor. If you're just driving by that thing every day, right, that building, oh my God, look how ostentatious it is. And they're trying, you know, and so forth. Actually, if you talk to Wasim, the guy who's building it, he's a Madison resident for like 50 years. He raised his kids in Madison. Both of his kids went to high school. They played football. He owns businesses in town. And his feeling was, I've lived here my whole life. I've raised my family here. We're part of the community, um, but we're fringe. Our way of becoming part of the community is because you can drive another mile and see six churches, but you won't see a synagogue anywhere near Madison. Um, but, but he's saying we want to be part of this community. We want to plant our piece here. We're not trying to take ground. We're trying to share ground. We want to be a part of this community. And that is his message. But you can imagine the person just driving by and all the messages that they can imagine in their mind. So this, again, is part of it. And that's where it comes all the way back to ask yourself, like, why did I do that? Why did I drive past that thing 25 times without ever stopping, pulling in, saying, hi, you know. Um, I had an uh, uh two doors down from Pakistan. Um, I met him the first day that he was out there, and he was maybe cutting his grass, and I was cutting my grass, and you know, you hate to turn the lawnmower off, especially mine, because I'm never sure it's gonna turn off. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I shut it down, it, it does that. And I was like, but I have to immediately go over and say hi to this guy. Because I bet you there's a good chance of moving into Forum Park. He's thinking, am I going to fit in this community? Am I going to be looked at as different? Uh, my name is Ali. My kid's name is Samir. Are people going to treat my child differently in school? Are we going to, right? And so if I just keep cutting my grass, he's going to say, I guess I was right. Right? My neighbors don't really want to know me. So I said, it is so important is that, that the first minute I stop what I'm doing and go over and say, hi, I'm Jonathan, I'm your neighbor, welcome to our neighborhood, right? And then from there, that changes the, the dynamic. Um, so yeah, we got the five minute signal. So other kind of burning <laughs> questions that you have, no. conflicts that we think are particularly pressing and important, and ones that maybe we won't be able to resolve them today, but let's maybe see if we can name them, and things that we can think more intentionally about, right? Maybe just getting them on the t table on the surface might help us, yeah. Uh, you use the word transformation, um, but I think conflict can transform itself into another kind. So, uh, as, as an example, um, when Obama was elected president, we thought a black man is president. Right. We've all come to terms with racism. We're all going to embrace each other, and we're going to go forward. Only to find that a significant portion of the population saw that as a threat. And 
some of that threat has, has revealed itself in some of the politics we have today. So the question is, well, what is the conflict? Is it something else now? How do we address what it is now, and how do we deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you just uncovered something like profound, like in the final moments. But, but I think you're a hundred percent right. I mean, this was so problems that that go away on their own come back on their own, right? So that's the first lesson right there, right? We thought, oh wow, here's an indication that the vast majority, or at least a, a majority of Americans, um, right, are are over it and are per perfectly fine with a black man being in the White House. And we realized that actually the whatever other percentage that were suddenly came out in great, great force. 100% um, what you say. Um, and so again, back to Daniel Shapiro, um, it gets to, he, he, he talks about like, that sometimes we look at our species and human societies as, he, he has these terms, homo uh, economicus, that we're driven just by our economic interests, and that's the most important thing. But that, that's not what it is. Um, he then goes into homo emoticus, that we get caught up in these sort of emotions and emotional values, and that's what drives us. He goes, to his deepest level that he works on is homo identicus, he calls it, that we are driven by identity. There's also a great book by Heather McGee that came out about two years ago called The Sum of Us, where she's saying, why will white Americans, the vast majority of white working class Americans, support policies that hurt them? And she puts like almost on the cover the, the issue of the, the, this infamous example of like when they started to force the integration of public pool. You know, you had in the 1930s and 40s the rise of the public pool in communities. And as soon as the civil rights era, they started to say they must be integrated, people poured cement into their own pool. We'd rather deprive everybody of the pool rather than swim with people of another like race, right? And so, the, but that becomes this metaphor for people who do things that hurt themselves to protect their identity. So we don't talk about identity enough, and I think that's what's at stake here. People perceiving this guy is so different, this guy is an alien, this guy, and, and of course it comes out in all the other ways. I mean, the birtherism, right? Oh, he wasn't born in this country, like literally to try and say that Obama was not in America. Right? And we, we know who was at the front of that birth of movement, right? Um, and all of that kind of gave rise to what we're confronting right now. Um, and so this idea of people looking at what, what it means to be an American, how you can be with the exact same rhetoric from a century ago about immigrants, poisoning the blood, bringing disease, taking jobs, etc., can be repeated a hundred years later. And some of the very people screaming and shouting these, you know, um, statements, the loudest, are the very, very group that was targeted by those statements 100, 150 years ago, right? So we've never dealt with it. I mean, I think that's part of it, conflict transformation. So this will be a great just uh, land on one. So conflict management is how do we just keep the two people from killing one another, right? Um, if I can, in, in one minute, do this story of the, of the orange, and the last orange at the market, and the two parties show up and say, it's my orange, it's my orange, and the vendor doesn't know what to do, cuts it in half, sends them both home. It turns out that one person squeezes the orange to make juice for their sick child. The other one takes the rind and throws away the pulp to make a jam for their hungry child who's having digestive problems. They both could have had all of what they wanted instead of cutting it in half and then throwing away half of that. That would have been conflict resolution. Conflict transformation is, why is there only one orange for two people? Why is it, what is the, what is it? The, what, what are the conditions that create the problem in the first place? And until we transform the conditions that create the conflict, we're never going to resolve the conflict. So you're not going to resolve the conflict of is it Harris or is it Trump or is it Obama or is it whomever. We're going to resolve the conflict when we say, what is our problem around race, identity, ethnicity, and so forth in this country? That, you know, to your point, is one of the biggest problems that is driving our, our country apart. Do Muslims think things about Jews? Do Jews think things about Christians? And when we haven't sat in a room with people from those communities, we haven't learned a single thing and we will never, ever transform those conflicts. So transformation, conflict transformation, takes us to 
you know, the steepest um, level. So we can just end with this one, also from sort of full circle on Matthew here, go and make peace with that person and then come and offer your gift, right? So deal with the real, real problem. Um, deal, you know, uh, go directly to the person with whom we have a conflict, with whom we have a disagreement, talk to them. Don't talk about them. That's a very clear message coming from Jesus, right? Don't, don't talk about others with the person you're fighting with, right? And even God can't resolve that problem for you. You need to confront the other person. You need to hear them. And that's when they will hear you. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Really.